Man, I am having an off day. This is the third time I've tried to do this. Normally, I don't ever typically script any of these films and I can just talk. And today I am just fumbling at epic, epic levels. Um, I've had too much social interaction over the past couple of weeks and that's not good for me. That's like kryptonite. I'm very much a loner. I do much better when I'm by myself alone for long periods of time. So operation isolation is now in effect. But this is a film about reading. But I cannot talk to you about reading unless we talk about the elephant in the room first. Because if we don't address the elephant in the room, I don't think you're gonna be successful in your attempt to read, especially at a level, a high level, if you will. Although the definition of high level of reading could vary from person to person. The elephant in the room is this. And what this brings us to which is basically an endless amount of nonsense that has no relevance or bearing on our life. Now, I'm gonna bring up a phrase here that I think is maybe one of the most signature phrases of the modern era. And that phrase is endless or mindless scrolling. Let's just stick with mindless because it sort of fits my mental state at the moment. Mindless scrolling. I think any of you, any of us, because I'm gonna throw myself under the bus as well, at some point in our lives with this device, probably in the last 24 hours, we have found ourselves mindlessly scrolling through content that has absolutely no relevance or bearing on our life. This is an epidemic in our society, in our culture, and it's one of the reasons why things are unraveling in places like here in the United States. This term, mindless scrolling, might have popped up on your radar as of late because China made some changes to their uh, access to the internet based on them looking at other regions of the world, namely the United States and Europe, looking at the youthful generations in these regions and saying, we don't want our youth to become influencers. We actually want productive members of society. We want doctors, lawyers, engineers. And so they've built, they're and starting to build mechanisms into access to the internet that create breaks where your internet drops for a period of several minutes to give you a chance to break the cycle of mindless scrolling. Mindless scrolling is a physical addiction, and this is where we get on a slippery slope. Clearly, I'm not a medical professional. I'm really not a professional in anything other than knowing that I'm not a professional. That's my one true skill. When you talk about physical addictions, I would break it into A, B, C tier, tiers. A tier would be substance abuse, drugs, alcohol. Almost across the board, when you say to someone, hey, I've got a substance abuse problem, that is a recognized fact of people saying, wow, that's a true addiction. Yes, you need, you need to seek treatment. Dropping to the B tier, you'll have sex and gambling. You run into fewer people who say, oh, that's 100% across the board. Those are legitimate addictions. There's plenty of people out there that say, oh, well, you just quit gambling or just quit having sex. Tier C is technology addiction. And the vast majority of people that I know on the planet today have at least to a slight degree a technological addiction but there's very few people who will admit to that or cop to the fact that they are addicted. If you get up in the morning and the first thing you do is reach for your phone, chances are you're, you're angling in this direction. The worst thing you can possibly do if your goal in life is to read a lot more is to get up and touch your phone. My phone is off and left in another room and I do not turn it on in the morning until my quote unquote work day starts. Then I turn the phone on and I use it as minimally as I possibly can. I don't know if I mentioned this on a film before, but starting about two weeks ago, every single morning in my inbox email, I unsubscribed to every single thing and every single person and brand and organization I possibly could, with the exception <clears throat> of about five brands that I have a personal connection to or a relationship with. Everything else and everyone else I unsubscribed. This took weeks and it was hundreds of these emails that were coming in. Now, I'm gonna slowly rebuild that list uh, over time, but I'm also trying to keep a, a parameter and a containment on this. If you're mindlessly scrolling, if you're looking at a bunch of things that don't have any relevance to your life, until you address that, I don't think you should even bother to try to read at the level that I think you're telling me you wanna read. Now, <clears throat> the number of books you read is unimportant. 
if I had to put a number <clears throat> on the annual number of the approximate number of books that I read, it would be between somewhere between 50 and 100 books a year. That means nothing. It's not a competition. And I could be reading comic books, I could be reading pamphlets and brochures and then telling you I'm reading a book and then it makes it look like, well, I'm reading it's blah, blah, blah a week. You know, Bill Gates allegedly reads three, four, five, six books a week. I don't care. Those numbers are irrelevant. To me, it's about the topic and the subject matter. One of the bizarre questions I've had over the past, past my YouTube experience over the past year is people will write, reach out to me and ask what to photograph. And I find that absolutely and utterly bizarre because I've never been in that position. I have a list of story ideas <clears throat> that is so long, if I didn't have to work for the rest of my life, I wouldn't come remotely close to being able to accomplish and complete all of these stories. If I get to maybe two to 5% of these stories between now and the time I croak, it'll be a miracle. And so I have got a lit long list of stories that I wanna do. I don't have that problem. And one of the reasons I don't have the problem is because I love to read. Let's talk about, I know what you're doing. You're sitting out there and you're like, Milner, you're waxing poetic. Tell us more about this reading thing. Uh, is it only you that have discovered this? No, actually there's more than, more than me. Plenty of people out there read. Just go to the library, which is a fascinating place by the way. And if you're looking for people who hoard or maybe live in their car, the library is also kind of like a magnet for these folks. I love the library. I go to the library all the time and you'll see this book has that crazy sheen on it. It's because it has the plastic coating because yes, this is a library book. I read far too many books to actually buy uh, most of them. I just did buy two books on birding that I, I wanted to own because I'll probably read and reread them over the years. And I also bought a bird reference book, which obviously is gonna be with me from now until the end of time. And that's not something I wanted to keep checking out from the library. Number one, I read because I am curious about the world. The single most important trait to be a photographer in my mind is curiosity. This kills curiosity. This kills knowledge because this falsely makes you believe that you know everything because you are skipping a stone across a pond and that is the kind of depth that the internet gives you unless you really go mining for real information. How many times recently have you heard crazy people being interviewed on the news and they're like, well, I did my research about you know, horse paste and, uh, and they're like, okay, well, what was the research? <whistles> yeah, there is, to do research online, you really gotta dig. You've, you gotta be curious about the world. It's like driving down the country road and the road splits. And in my mind, I'm like, what's down there and what's down there? I wanna see both places. I wanna see what's out there. Curiosity is the single most important ingredient, I think, to being a good documentary photographer in particular. Number two, I wanna read because I wanna continue my education. So this is a book called The Humboldt Current. And for those of you who live, let's say, in Peru, I think you'll be probably pretty familiar with the Humboldt uh, or Alexander von Humboldt is who the book is about. And the Humboldt current is a current off the coast of Latin America that drives cold water north. But Humboldt influenced Thoreau, Whitman, Darwin, and basically every single ecologist and environmentalist in the world. But in America, it's bizarre. He's hardly known at all. Everybody knows Charles Darwin. Not many people know about Alexander von Humboldt, even though you have Humboldt County in California, you have the Humboldt Current, you have the Humboldt Mountains and the Humboldt River in Nevada, all of these places. And he came to America one time and he, ha and he happened to come here and hang out with good old Tommy Jefferson, good old TJ. They had a little meeting in the mines and oh, by the way, some of those, those ardent flag waving people who talk about the constitution and people like Thomas Jefferson. If you had any idea of what Thomas Jefferson's idea for the American West was, I think you'd be a bit shocked. That's the kind of thing that comes from a book like this. I, this one book alone, and by the way, the full title is the Humboldt current 19th century exploration and the roots of American environmentalism. This one book will provide enough stories for the rest of your life. I am not joking, this one book, because this is a thick book, and there's just enough pers personal history and personal story from the author, Aaron Sachs, just enough to break up the density of information that he's delivering. 
And so just when you think, man, this is so dense, and I take notes when I read these books, and I've got pages and pages and pages, and I've only, I'm only like 80 pages into the book, and I've just got like the Dead Sea Scrolls worth of notes on this book. That's enough to keep me going for the rest of my life. So I want to continue my education. There's, there's more topics I don't know about than, than I do, because I'm a total dumbass, which you should know by now. Okay, percentage-wise, I read about 80% nonfiction and 20% fiction. Fiction to me is a relief from time to time where if I go from, from sort of dense book to dense book to dense book, sometimes it'll wear me down a little bit. And also it just overloads my brain in terms of the capability of what I'm able to process. So I'll throw in a spy novel, I'll throw in Chip Kid's Cheese Monkeys, I'll throw in something like that. By the way, Chip Kid, if you don't know him, not only is an amazing author, he's also an amazing designer, graphic designer, who's done more book covers than you can possibly imagine. Let me spell that out for you. Chip, C-H-I-P, Kid, K-I-D-D. And the book of his that I absolutely love is called The Cheese Monkeys, which is a novel about art school, which is hilarious. And oh, by the way, I actually wrote him one time, tracked him down, tracked down an email address, fired one off like a shot across the bow, and guess what? Mr. Kid wrote me back. That's called professionalism. He was funny, he was cool, and now I like him even more. 80% nonfiction, because again, I'm trying to educate myself. And what I love about book form is that book form material. I do not read stuff online, typically. I do not read magazines. I do not read short stories. I do not read short form anything. Because here's the rub, the real wonderful part of this. Let's think unicorns and rainbows and all those things that we hold so dear to our hearts. Reading, try to follow me here, Fletch. You can't run the headline and then not run the story. Really? Why not? Reading allows you to literally physically change the superstructure of your brain to ingest long form material as opposed to flip, flip, as opposed to does this look familiar? What are you doing? I'm looking at Instagram. What's the single best photo you've seen in the last 10 minutes? I don't know because I can't remember any of them. So you wanna get away from this and you wanna come in to this. It reprograms physically your brain, which is absolutely fantastic. I had a little note here on this was point three about 80% nonfiction. I said, when you read 300 pages about magnetic inclination, you might need a break and a spy novel might be just what you need. That's what I'm talking about, balance. I know some people who just read fiction and they read like maniacs. I have no problem with that at all. Again, fiction books, especially historical fiction, can give you little glimpses into something that you've never thought about. It can show you a way to see the world that you haven't thought about. So fic there's absolutely nothing wrong with fiction. Just for whatever reason, I prefer nonfiction. Number four. The printed word, in my opinion, when it comes to creativity, is the high art. I put the written word well above photography or anything else. Because here's what I've always been fascinated by. Let's say that you and I are basically the same person. Let's say that there's a Danish version of me, or a Singaporean version of me, or maybe even a Peruvian version of me, and we have approximately the same history and the same schooling, which means we maybe have the access to the same vocabulary. But you, the Singaporean version of me, is able to put those words in an order that's magic. Stephen King calls it the writer's telepathy, where he can describe a red table, but that red table to different readers looks in their brain like a different table, like specific to them. That's why I love the high art of the word. The word means I don't need to be on the front lines to write about something. I can actually do it because I have the access to my imagination and I can put words in an order that's different from how you can put words in an order. And I don't have to be there, I don't have to go. Now that was something that always drove me a little bit crazy in the, as a newspaper photographer was oftentimes reporters would write a story from the office and not have to be on the front lines. And as a photographer, you had to be there and sometimes reporters would get the story, they would nail it, and then other times it would be completely inaccurate and you're like, wow, you weren't there. So there's an upside and a downside to it, but I hold words at the highest level. Point number five is a reminder of the first message of this film. Do not, under any circumstances, get up and turn this on. 
Do not do that to yourself in the morning. People who do that are not interesting. They're not imaginative. They're not inspiring. They're followers. And you don't want to be a follower. You want to be your own person. And the only way you're gonna do that is to figure out what's floating around in this little soft melon right here. What do you believe? How do those beliefs make you feel? Might be a good place to start. I don't know. Call me crazy. Number six, I schedule my reading on a level of importance as everything else. As a Zoom call, as a blurb call, a work call, a workshop. I'm doing an interview tonight at seven o'clock. Reading is on par. So the first thing I do in the morning is I get up and I make coffee. And by the way, my coffee is better than yours. I make the most insanely good coffee that's a mix of a bio. It's, it's kind of an offshoot, a bastardization of Bulletproof coffee. I don't like Bulletproof coffee. I use a different brand, stronger brand. And I'm blending four or five things, including red chili from Chimayo uh, every day, which is pretty, pretty great. Someone came and visited us recently and I made them coffee in the morning. And a couple of months later, they wrote and said, hey, you literally changed our lives by giving us that recipe. So I make coffee and I read. Now my wife is typically asleep. If she, for some unknown reason, gets up at the same time for me, this derails everything. Because my wife is, is a maniac, basically. And this morning, if I told you what happened this morning, you would probably light a candle in my benefit and be like, come on, man, stay strong. But most of the time, she sleeps later than me. Get up and I read. And that's for at least 45 minutes to an hour. There's no distractions. And it is heaven. This is the best part of the day for me. I'm an early riser. I always have been because I grew up hunting and fishing. And with everybody in the family, for the most part, except my brother, who's a loaf, who would sleep until three if you let him, up early. So I schedule it. I put reading on par in importance as any other task that I'm doing. Pretty easy after you do that. Number seven, every single successful person I know, every single one that I know that I want to know and be friends with is a reader. Every single one. Now, there are people that I know that are successful in fields that I have no interest in, who are kind of not people that I wanna be friends with, who are successful, who may or may not read, I don't know for sure. But everyone I know well, who I look at and admire, and these are people at very high levels in finance or creativity, they all read. Reading is a huge part of their lives. And some of these people, liter literally, the range of what they read is from the Bible to famous literature to current events. And I know a guy who just reads the Bible. Every single day, he gets up like me super early and all he does is read the Bible. He's probably 75 years old. Amazing guy would give you the shirt off his back. He's a billionaire and he just reads the Bible, that's it. But for some unknown reason, the guy knows everything about everything. You can talk to him about any subject and he knows it, but I've never seen him read anything outside of the Bible. So I don't know, maybe he's a sleeper, maybe he's holding out at me, or maybe it's a fake Bible cover and inside he's reading like National Lampoon. I don't know, could be. He's a, he's a crafty, slippery dude. Number eight, reading, except for Amazon, is contrary to what all of the big tech giants want. The big tech giants and the social companies in particular do not want you to read. Reading takes too much time, it's too slow, and their maximum profitability angle from that side is not good. So just know that the culture that we're creating in the world today is designed to keep you from doing things like reading. Reading feels like quicksand. It is so slow, it's like molasses. One of the things that I've noticed is kids, and the difficulty that kids are having reading. Not all, but many, including some of the kids in my life who when you talk about a book or they see me reading, come over of course with their phone in their hand and they, the concept of sitting for an extended period of time and focusing on one thing is so foreign to them, which is scary to me because I think it's leading us in a very bizarre direction and I think if you look at modern events and current history here in America, I think you've got all the proof you need that things are coming undone a little bit. She's come undone. I've never really liked that song, but it's always stuck in my head. Number nine, non-readers are not inspiring people. I find them actually kind of boring. Sorry, if you're a non-reader for the most part, uh, you know, consistently, I hate to make a blanket statement, but it's my channel and I will and I'm okay with that. Kind of boring, I know that's jaded, but people who don't read, I just don't find that interesting. And 
the kiss of death for me is when someone says to me, hey, did you see that thing on Facebook? If someone, if you say that to me in my company, I will never be around you again. I depart, I go, I leave. I can't handle it, nails on a chalkboard. Or, oh, did you see this thing on Instagram? And then they're flip, 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 trying to find it and they're doing this. Oh, check this out, look at this on Instagram. Oh, yes, this other thing, do this. Those people, I can't hang out. And frankly, I know a lot of photographers who now fall into that category and I do not spend time with them anymore. My wife and I had this conversation last night in the kitchen. Right over there, you can't see it, but there is a kitchen. We were talking about one friend that we have that is so bad, now it is impossible to talk to them because they can't, first of all, if you are this close talking to them one-on-one, -on -one, they cannot make eye contact. And in the middle, you could be telling them that there's an alien landing behind them, coming at them, and they'd be like, hang on a minute. They would just be on their Instagram feed. They cannot function without it. And so I told her, my wife, I said, I'm done. I cannot spend time with these people anymore because they bore the living hell out of me. And they're like skittish little woodland creatures. They're the cute little furry thing that's hunted by every other thing in the forest. Not the, not the job you want basically. Okay, number 10 is people always ask me for book recommendations. Now, I can make a few suggestions, but again, I don't know who you are and what you're interested in, so I'm not sure what the benefit is going to be for me telling you about these books because you may say, I don't care about the Humboldt Current. I just want to get barreled, man. I want to get barreled off the coast of Peru. I don't care. I wish the water was warmer. Screw the Humboldt Current, right? If that's you, then that's probably not a book for you, but I'm going to give you some. What do you love? What are you curious about? What do you not know about? What infuriates you? What makes you happy? What makes you laugh? Those are kind of things that are gonna narrow it down. A few books to consider, and these are all across the board. Number one, Blood Meridian by Cormac McCarthy. Blood Meridian is a book I've probably read 10 times. I've probably bought 50 copies of that book and given it away. The books that I really like, I buy stacks of them, I keep them in the van or the trunk of my car. And when I meet someone who's a reader and we talk books, I give them copies because these are books that I love. When I first read Blood Meridian, I was like, number one, I'm a dumbass because there's no possible way I would ever be able to pull off something like writing a book like this. And you realize how unique Cormac McCarthy's brain is. And obviously the, the road, the movie The Road is also a book, No Country for Old Men. There's a long track record here. Blood Meridian is part of what's called the Border Trilogy. All the Pretty Horses and Cities of the Plain are the other two books in the series. Blood Meridian, to me, is the centerpiece. This book is insane. Now, apparently, the screenplay for Blood Meridian and the rights to it, the film, have been passed around in Hollywood for decades because no one has any idea how to make this film. The closest I could say is it's a cross between Apocalypse Now and Pale Rider. 1800s, Texas-Mexico border, marauders, a very strange sort of Colonel Kurtzy character called the judge, and, and this young boy that called the kid. And it is violent and dark. Part of it are written in like tongues, different kind of tongues. Fascinating book. I'm absolutely mesmerized by it. There were passages in the book where I read, and then up five pages later, I was like, wait a second. And I had to go back and reread because I was like, oh, the sort of mindless violence of the time and era. That is a masterpiece to me, Blood Meridian. The other two books in the series I'm actually not a huge fan of. I do love No Country for Old Men and I do love The Road, although The Road is quite a bit down for me. No Country, and I think the screenplay for No Country was, was, was absolutely astoundingly good. Um, the, the first line, the crime today, you can hardly take its measure. That sort of set the tone for me. Amazing book. The second book I'll talk about is Rum Diary by Hunter Thompson. If I was looking for an author who got trashed more by the literary establishment, which is the biggest bunch of uptight stooges in the world, coupled with the writer who is ripped off more than anyone else by the literary establishment, but then not credited, it would be Hunter Thompson. Dr. Hunter Thompson. Hunter Thompson is a unique author. Uh, he's also one of the guys that first blended what I would call magic realism in journalism, where he would blend absolutely factual stories with little bits of completely fabricated pieces done masterfully. An incredible sense of humor. He does not get the credit he deserves. Um, he ended his own life in dramatic fashion a few years ago. Obviously, there have been plenty of films made about him and documentaries made about him. His books like Hell's Angels and Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas... The Great Shark Hunt, uh, Fear and Loathing on the Campaign Trail. Those are books that got a lot of, 
a lot of talk and press, but the sleeper book for me was actually his first book, which is Rum Diary. And Rum Diary was also made into a film, which I think I would give that film about a C, C level. There are parts of it that I thought were interesting, but it's really, really hard to pull that one off. The book Rum Diary, I think is brilliant because it was the first indicator of who he was going to be as an author. And this is a book you can read in a couple hours. It's hilarious but you're also beginning to see the emergence of a unique voice in literature. And so Rum Diary is the one I would go for. Um, Seven Pillars of Wisdom is another book. Uh, this one is a little dense. This one is a little heavy. This is a book that has influenced countless explorers and journalists and photographers through the years. I can't even go into all the specifics of what this book is about. This is a book that I own that I reread probably every five, five to 10 years. And it's dense, it was incredibly inspiring to me. Some, some of the journalists that I've talked to that I've been most inspired by in my life were also mentioned this book, Seven Pillars of Wisdom. Cheese Monkeys, I mentioned before. Um, Wisdom of Yoga. I do yoga probably four to five days a week. Uh, it's a weird bastardized version of yoga that I've sort of come up with. That's my strength training, my core training, a little bit of cardio, flexibility and yoga have sort of built into it. Yoga was life changing for me. I was injured when I was living in Los Angeles a few years ago, and uh, I was on an exercise bike because that was one of the few things I could do, and I looked over into this sort of glass room at the gym, and there was this yoga class going on. And there were probably like eight people in it total, and there was one guy, and the rest were female. And the guy was in misery. You could just look in. I was like, I'm, I'm not, I'm inflexible, but he was at an all-time high. He was horrible. He could like not touch his knees if he bent over and he was in there every day just grinding it out. And I kind of looked and I was like, I don't know anything about yoga and I can't, I'm sort of injured and maybe I should give it a try. So I end up going into this class and it unbeknownst to me, the instructor was an absolute world-class yoga instructor who moonlighted at this gym that I was going to like two or three days a week. But she was famous in this other yoga studio in, in Santa Monica and for some reason, she decided to teach at this gym. I had no idea. So for basically two and a half years, I had private instruction from this unbelievable yogi who basically could, when I walked in that room, she looked at me and knew exactly what I was. She knew exactly what I could do and what I couldn't do. And she also knew that I did not understand yoga at all. I looked at yoga as a physical exercise. And she said to me, this is about your breathing and your brain. The physical exercise is a sideshow that you will catch up on eventually, but you need to understand this is about breathing in the brain. That took me about a year and a half to figure out because I'm a blunt instrument. And I was like, don't tell me what to do, Yogi. I'm at the gym, man. I'm just gonna do forearms and neck because that's, that's what everybody likes. So yoga changed my life. Yoga also helped me and continues to help me with dealing with Lyme disease. So there is a book called Wisdom of Yoga, and I think the author's last name is Cope, K-O-P-P, -P, something like that, K-O-P-E, K-O-P-P. -P. It's fantastic, and it breaks down the history of yoga, which, by the way, if you don't know about and you think you do know about yoga, I think this book is going to throw you a right turn because it is crazy how this thing, how yoga developed and where it came from. Great book. Let's just talk authors in general, and then I'm going to kill this because we're at 28 minutes. Paul Bowles, Joan Didion, Ernest Hemingway, Gretel Ehrlich. These are authors that I read all the time. I get whatever I can get my hands on. And for all of these famous authors, there's millions of people like this. Like I don't know Aaron Sachs. I didn't know Aaron Sachs until I saw The Humboldt Current. Now The Humboldt Current came from a recommendation from someone who I respect, who reached out to me and said, do you know this guy? I said, no. Do you know this book? No. Milner, get it now, read it. I was like, great. Went to the library the next day and got it. Millions of great books out there. You don't necessarily need to read these famous authors. You will eventually get to them. But again, just look at what you're interested in, what makes you curious, and move forward with it from that direction. And I think you will be happy. I'm a big fan of taking notes while you're reading nonfiction because you'll remember about 80% more than if you didn't write it down. And don't worry about reading fiction or reading a silly book or reading something small and in what you might deem as inconsequential because you never know what it's going to unlock in your brain. So good luck. Turn those pages. And the last thing I'll say, because there's always a last thing with me, read paper books if possible. Even if you're a big fan of the Kindle, and I have a Kindle when I'm traveling, 
hasn't been plugged in in two years, but uh, we'll get to that at another point. Paper. Just read a paper book. Even if you like the Kindle, throw me a bone, do me a favor. I just wasted 30 minutes of my life trying to help you with this stuff. Damn it. Read a paper book. And I will be back at some point. <laughs>